lecture we learned about variational autoencoder and we learned how can we use variational autoencoder as a type of uh, generative model. Uh, today's lecture will be mainly about GAN, uh, generative adversarial network, it's another type of uh, generative model. Uh, this is the uh, main paper. You know, these people does not exist. These are generated by GAN. Possibly you have seen uh, demos of GAN, you know, uh, in, in many different applications. But these are quite realistic images generated by GAN. And we would like to see how this model works. You know, how can we do this? <coughs> there are other applications as well besides generating, you know, an image. You can transfer one domain to another domain using GAN. Uh, these are some, some examples of transferring, uh, you know, for example, this domain to this domain or this domain to this domain. You have, you know, this picture and you want to find the map or you have it, you have uh, an image in the uh, day and you want to see how does it look like in the night or uh, you know, it's black and white and you want to see how does it look like if it's colored or you have the sketch of the image and you want to uh, see the final shape. Uh, this can be also done with GAN, but we start with generating an image and then we'll see how this application can be done using GAN as well. So that's the general form of uh, GAN, uh, adversarial uh, network. <coughs> Uh, in terms of the philosophy, it's quite different from uh, whatever we have seen so far. Uh, it consists of two parts, a, a generator and a discriminator. Okay, uh, forget about GAN for, for, for a moment and about neural networks. Suppose that you want to teach uh, someone how to uh, paint, how to write, how to do uh, a job. Uh, you have, uh, you know, you want to teach your kid how to paint uh, a bird, for example. And you get your uh, child to draw a bird and you give some feedback. That's not good enough, for example, or you would say something better than this, you know, you would say that uh, you can do better than this. Uh, anyway, you give some feedback and uh, they try to crack themselves, make it better, right? And uh, gradually, you can teach them to improve their skills in terms of, you know, uh, painting, for example. This is exactly the same philosophy, you know, think of this generator as a child who wants to learn how to paint. And think of this discriminator as yourself who want to give feedback to your child. Uh, so you have a generator which takes just uh, a noise a sample from a noun distribution, say for example from a Gaussian. You know, we know how to sample from a Gaussian. Sample from a Gaussian and then this G is a neural network, a transformation, which takes this G and supposed to produce, say, an image, uh, which look like face, for example. That's, that's the goal. And you have to give some feedback to, to this generator. And the feedback goes from this discriminator, okay? So this discriminator is a classifier. And this classifier, has access to some real data, you know, images of real people, and has access to the output of this generator. And the role of this discriminator is to decide the input is fake or real. So basically, if discriminator works correctly and perfectly, any image coming from this data set will be labeled one, real. And any image coming from the generator, which be labeled fake, it's not real, you know. <clears throat> you, 
you are going to define some sort of adversarial game between these two parts. Generator wants to generate images in a way that the discriminator cannot realize it's fake or real. So it should be as good as uh, non-distinguishable with real image. And generator, you know, they're competing with each other. And, and, and discriminator wants to uh, basically uh, catch the generator and say, no, you can't fool me. This is, this is uh, fake. This is not real, you know. So uh, we have to train this model in a way that discriminator in each iteration is better than the discriminator that we had before in terms of making distinction between real and fake. And generator is better in a way that discriminator cannot realize it's fake or real, okay? So we have a game between these two parts of the network and uh, they basically compete with each other. That's the philosophy of GAN, okay? <clears throat> okay, see, okay, so I think the philosophy is clear and now we have to see how we can uh, basically train such a model. You know, we have two different parts that are competing with each other, it's different from Whatever we had so far, you know, we had a network and we had the loss function and we had to minimize that loss function or maximize that loss function. It's different now. You know, we have two parts. They're competing with each other. Uh, and uh, let's see how we can uh, uh, basically train this type of network. So far, is there any question? Because it's essential to understand what you're supposed to do before uh, see the details of the training and why it works. Okay, uh, <clears throat> this is the objective function that we are going to. It's not uh, a minimization, it's not maximization, it's a min-max problem. So we have two components, we have discriminator D and we have generator G, and we define a min-max problem. Given a generator, we want to maximize this objective function. And given the discriminator, we want to minimize this objective function. So suppose that the generator is fixed, maximize this function and find, uh, basically f change the uh, weights of the discriminator in a way that this objective is higher, you know, maximize. And assume that the discriminator, the, the, the weights of discriminator is fixed then try to minimize this objective function. I mean, uh, tweak the uh, weights of the generator in a way that this objective is less. So this is the objective function. So the objective function is expectation of log of dx. You know, dx is basically the output of this discriminator, which is one or zero. And if it is log one, it's gonna be zero. And if it's log zero, it's gonna be minus infinity, right? And you have another term here, which is D of GZ. GZ is what? Z is the input of this generator. And it's gonna produce an image, which eventually I would like this image look like a real one. And uh, so I'm going to pass this to the discriminator. So this D, D GZ is basically uh, the output of this process that I fit this generator with, uh, say, a Gaussian noise, a Gaussian random variable, and it produces an image, and I pass this image to discriminator, and I'm looking at, instead of log of D, I'm looking at log of one minus D, okay? So just the opposite of that one. So again, if it's one, it's gonna be log zero, I mean, if, if the discriminator decides that it's real, it's going to be 1 minus uh, 1, and log 0 would be negative infinity. If the discriminator decides that this is a fake image, uh, so it's going to be 1 minus 0, log 1 is going to be uh, 0, okay? Uh, you can play with this cost function in different scenarios. You know, assume that, for example, G is fixed and then see why this uh, discriminator, what the, why this cost function should be maximized. You know, if the uh, generator is fixed, for example, you know, and it produces something and this something is 
uh, real. I mean, it, it looks like real, you know, it, it's good image. Then uh, if discriminator make a mistake and uh, it, it, that's the output of the generator and if uh, basically discriminator make a mistake and think that it's, 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 it's real, you know, the value of this objective function in total, you can see that it's going to be less than the case that it makes a correct decision. You know, just play with this in different scenarios that a generator is fixed and, you know, you are, you are generating something. It is fake. Uh, by mistake, the discriminator say it's real or no, the discriminator tells, tell you the truth that it, it is fake and see that why uh, it should be maximized in this case and why it should be minimized in the other case. It's pretty uh, basically trivial to see. So that's the objective function, but we want to see that why this objective function does, you know. The objective function is not, this objective function is not easy to optimize and you will see some problems with that, but this is the procedure. First, we assume that, you know, suppose that we initialize both generator and discriminator, we assume that the weights of generator are fixed and we maximize it, find D. And then finding this D, we uh, fix the D and minimize this and find G and then keep going, you know, keep uh, alternating between these two stages until the model converges. <coughs> okay, uh, what does this objective do, you know, eventually? This is the objective function. I'm just going to write uh, the definition of expectation. You know, the first term, this is the definition of this expectation. And the second term is definition of this expectation. Uh, now, consider these identities. Uh, that X is basically G of Z. You know, we have this generator. We fit it with some random noise and the output is X. So X is equal to GZ. Another identity is that if X is GZ, then Z is G inverse of X. You know, think of this just conceptually. You may think that this network may not be invertible. In practice, it's not invertible, you know. So it's, I mean, this network, you can't use it backward. You can't, you know, fit it with X and get X, Z back, you know. But as a function, if this function is invertible, then you can say that, okay, if X is G Z, then Z is G inverse X. And then what is D Z? If Z is G inverse X, then D Z is G inverse prime at point X DX, right? So these identities are going to be important because I'm going to replace them here in this uh, objective function and uh, see what we can get. <coughs> Another important uh, basic identity here is uh, this uh, transformer, uh, distribution transformer identity. You know, you have a, tra you have a distribution you pass it through a, or you apply a transformer to this, you know. What would be the distribution after transformation? You know, you have Gaussian, you apply a transformation to Gaussian. What would be the uh, distribution of the transformed domain? The distribution of the transformed domain, if, you know, you apply, say, for example, um, if you have distribution Z, and then you have a function g, uh, then the transform domain actually has this form, you know. It's basically, uh, you know, g inverse of x is z. So that's the distribution of z times Jacobian of the inverse transformation. Okay, that's transformation rule when you transform uh, a distribution using a transformation. Okay, that's another identity that we're going to use. Okay. Um, and G should have some properties again, you know, it should be monotonic and we assume that, you know, that conceptually that this function has these properties. 
I think, I, I mean, we, we need an absolute value also here to make sure that it's positive. Okay, uh, now we had this expression and now I'm going to replace some of these identities and see what this expression looks like after applying them. You know, the first term will not change. The first term is the same. Look at the second term. In the second term, you know, I have PZ of Z. Instead of Z, I'm going to put G inverse of X. So it's going to be PZ G inverse of X here for this one. Then I have log of 1 minus DGZ. And uh, GZ is just X. It's 1 minus DX. And then I have DZ and DZ is G inverse prime X DX. Okay. Is that clear so far? Okay. Now, this term and this term. You know, this term and this term. What is this? PZ G inverse X times G inverse prime X. Sorry? It's PGX, right? Which is the distribution of generate okay we have p data that's the distribution of the real data that i have and this is going to be pg means the distribution of the output of the generate you know because i know what the distribution if i know what the, the distribution of the input of generator is that's going to be the distribution of the output of the generator it has to do with the jacobian of this g my my, my generate okay so I'm going to replace this part with PG. So that, that's going to be uh, my final expression here if I replace with PG. <clears throat> okay. Um, so I can make it just as one integral. So P data log DX plus PGX log 1 minus DX. And uh, so the, the process of training was that assume that G is fixed, maximize for D, assume D is fixed, maximize for G. Now assume that the G is fixed and we want to maximize for D. And that's my objective function, written only in terms of X. I don't have any Z here. You know, I just did all of these calculus to make sure that it's all uh, on, on, on uh, X's. And, uh, okay, so I have to maximize this. So it's an objective function. How can I maximize? I have to take derivative, set it to zero, right? And what would be the derivative of this? What's the derivative of this? You know, I have P data uh, log dx, for example, uh, and, and, and there's integral here, right? Think of this integral as summation, you know. Suppose it's summation. If it's summation, you're going to take derivative with respect to one of the terms of that summation. And this is one of the terms. So if I take derivative with respect to x, which is what this is going to be, you know, it's, it's log of dx would be 1 divided by dx, right, times p date. So uh, if I take this derivative, which would be basically the derivative of the one of the terms of this integral, so it's going to be p data divided by dx, because this is log, right? And this is going to be pg divided by 1 minus d, okay? This is the derivative, and I have to set this derivative equal to zero. Okay. Uh, so I have P data x divided by dx minus uh, Pg x divide by 1 minus dx, right? 
set to zero, solve for dx. So uh, if you if you do so, it's going to be you know it's going to be what? It's going to be dx times one minus dx. Then you have one minus dx pd minus uh, dx pg equal to zero, right? Which is going to be p d x minus d x uh, p d x minus d x p g x. Okay, and then I can uh, factor this. That's going to be like. Uh, Take these two on the other side. It's going to be uh, p d x divided by p d x plus p g x, right? Okay. So d x, if you solve for d x, d x is going to be p data divided by p data plus p g. That's in the case that generator is fixed. And I want to maximize for discriminator. And it basically tells me the optimum point is distribute, I mean, probability of data divided by data plus output of the generator. Okay? That's my optimum point. Okay, that was uh, my objective function. And I wanted to, uh, given G, I wanted to maximize for D. Uh, and now we learned what the optimum value of D is. Okay, let's replace this optimum value of D in the cost function. Okay. The optimum value is, uh, we just calculated, is just PD divided by PD plus PG. So I'm going to replace it here. PD divided by PD plus PG. Okay. Uh, Then I'm going to take one step further. You know, it's I divided this each of these by two, and I added a negative log for here, because uh, you know, uh, when I divide by two, it's as if you know I had uh, it's as if I have a two here, right? So if I get this read of these two, I can have like a negative log four at the end, right? Okay, so uh, this, what does it look like, you know? P of data log of P data divided by P data plus PG divided by two. KL divergence, right? KL divergence between what? Okay. P data and sorry. No, it was PJ. It was P data log P data divided by PJ. Remember, what was KL divergence? KL, uh, KL divergence of P and Q was uh, negative, actually. Uh, P log P divided by Q, right? So this is the KL divergence of what? P and PD plus PG over 2, right? Okay. So that's the KL divergence between P data and P data X plus PG over 2. And this is KL divergence of PG and P data plus PG over 2 minus log 4. And log 4 is constant, right? 
it doesn't have any effect in our optimization. But we know KL divergence is greater than equals zero. So if you want to minimize this objective function, the minimum value of the first term is going to be zero, and the minimum value of the second term should be zero, right? And basically, uh, the objective function, the, the minimum, the lower bound of this objective function is negative log four, right? Because these two should be zero. But a KL divergence measure the similarity of two distributions. Basically, the first term, when I'm minimizing, the first term tell me that P data should be similar to P data plus PG over two. And second term tells me that PG should be similar to P data plus PG over two, okay? So that's what the first term tell me if it, it is zero, if I minimize it. Um, Okay, uh, so base it ideally means that P data should be exactly the same as this distribution. And the, f the same for PG. PG should be exactly the same as this distribution. So P data is summation of P data and PG, and the P data is your real data and PG is the output of your generator, okay? Real data plus output of generator divided by two, that should be the same as distribution of your data. And P data plus output of generator divided by two should be the same as the distribution of your generator. You know, you have two different terms. So uh, what do you conclude from this? You know, P, uh, P data, is P data plus PG over two. And PG, let me write it just D. And PG is P data plus PG over two. Sorry? They're equal, so it's, it's PD is equal to PG, you know? So you can conclude that PD is equal to PG. Okay, what does it mean? It means that if I optimize this cost function in this step that G is given and I'm trying to maximize for D, I can match the distribution of data, which was real data, with the distribution of the output of generator. That's exactly what I wanted to do, right? That's exactly what I wanted to do. I wanted my generator to generate images that is not distinguishable from real, means it has the same distribution, right? As if it has been sampled from the real data. So uh, basically that's, that's the uh, uh, optimum point, the equilibrium of this uh, process that it matches the distribution of the output of generator with the uh, data, okay? You know, uh, I told you that KL divergence is not uh, basically, a KL divergence of PQ is not the same as QP, right? What we have here is uh, KL divergence of P and this and uh, G and this, you know, basically I have this uh, KL divergence of P and M and P KL divergence of Q and M. And uh, it's called uh, symmetric KL, or it's called uh, Jensen Shannon divergence. So uh, M is going to be the optimum point, will be that M is one half P plus G. That's exactly, you know, what we have here. Okay, uh, so. In any question so far? Yes. Just random noise. Sample a vector from, uh, you know, a Gaussian. But you know that the data have some distribution and they're discriminated in the, the second part of the uh, It's detecting the distribution, okay? Mm -hmm. But if you have a noise and a random distribution, uh, in every iteration, you are just querying some uh, part of the distribution out of the discrimination. So, uh, uh, I, I 
say that we cannot reuse it all the other part of the distribution. Which distribution? The, the second one. That is coming from the data. Uh, let, let me make sure that I understand your question. You know, you have this is this is my data. You know, this is this is my data. And this is collection of some faces, for example. Okay? Then I have a generator. And this generator actually uh, takes, uh, you know, to be consistent with our slide, generator is like this. Okay, we have a generator, and this generator actually takes a Z. This Z is sampled from a noun distribution, say for example, a Gaussian, okay? So I'm sampling, it's, it's a vector sample from multidimensional Gaussian. It passed to G, and I hope that this produced some X's, such this X has the same distribution of this data. What we learned so far was that this objective function that we introduced at the beginning is going to match the distribution of this, the output of this generator and the distribution of this data. So it should look like this, as, as if it's sampled from, from this. Now, what's your question now? Okay. But see, in every equation, you are actually uh, somehow querying the, the second part that uh, is this the, the sample that I'm creating? Is this real or not? Mm -hmm. So in every equation, you are just visiting a subset of the sample. Right. So, uh, and you may not learn the whole distribution. Yeah, yeah, yeah you may not learn the mm -hmm. whole Right. Very, very good point here, actually. This is a very common problem in the training of GAN, and it's called mode collapse. Okay. And mode collapse is a problem in sampling in general. You know, you have a distribution which is multimodal, for example. And you want to sample from this distribution. Forget about GAN. You want to sample from this distribution. And you're using a, a sampling method. Say, for example, you're using MCMC, for example, to do this, right? It's possible that you get stuck here. And you sample all the time from this area. And you never visit the other parts. And there are techniques in MCMC to uh, basically skip this mode and go to the other modes. That's also a problem in, in, in GAN, that if the distribution of your data is multimodal, which is in practice, then it's possible that your generator learns only a part of this distribution, instead of the whole distribution. And when it, it starts to generate, you know, it, it generates a subset of your data, not the whole data, you know. It hasn't learned everything. It's called mode collapse, but we will talk about mode collapse, that how we can get around mode collapse later on. But it's a very good point that, yeah, it, it's possible that it's going to happen. Okay, any other question? Yes. Um, so you mentioned that it's, uh, the, it's called Jensen, Jensen Shannon. Mm -hmm. It's symmetric, so yeah. that makes it take a distance based on what I'm Distance, uh, distance needs to have four properties, you know, we have to check that. Uh, it should be symmetric. Distance of a point in itself should be zero, which I think it is the case here. It should satisfy triangular inequality. Uh, we have to check that if it satisfies triangular inequality. But it, it needs four properties actually to be satisfied. But if it does make, meet that requirement? It is a distance, yes. Then Of course. But do you mean to switch to other the use like since since the derivation gets you to a metric in the end. Mm -hmm. Then can, does that mean that you can Yeah, if you need a metric somewhere, you can use it as a metric. 
if, if, if it satisfies, but on top of my head, I'm not sure that if it satisfies all of the conditions or not. Most likely it does, you know, most likely it does, because it is positive. And it, it uh, you know, the distribution itself is zero here, and it is symmetric. I think it satisfies all of them, but I have to make sure that triangular inequality will be satisfied also. The, the other three is trivial. I think it's as far as the, the fourth one as well, but you have to check that. Yeah, but if this is the case, you can use it as a metric, a proper metric. Oh, yes. 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 Fix G, max. Fix D, min. And keep going, actually, until it converges. Um, So summary, this is ob our objective function and we have generator and discriminator and uh, we're going to find the, basically assuming that the G is fixed, we are going to find the arg max of this and assuming that, uh, I mean, given G, we are going to maximize this, which basically is going to be uh, this function, negative 2 log 2 which, or log uh, 4 and uh, two times of this uh, symmetric KL divergence. That's the objective function. <clears throat> okay. Uh, this is uh, basically some images that is generated by variational autoencoder when variational autoencoder is trained on uh, CFAR 10. Okay, there are 10 categories of images. And this is GAN trained on the same data set. Uh, if basically our perception is, as long as our perception is concerned, the output of GAN is usually much better than the output of variational autoencoder as a generative model. You know, I uh, briefly, you know, this is GAN and this is variational autoencoder. So I briefly mentioned this the other day that uh, variational autoencoder maximized the likelihood, right? So in fact, if you look at these images, the likelihood of these images are better than the likelihood of the images generated by GAN. Okay. But uh, in terms of our perception, our perception basically decide that this is a better image compared to this one. Don't for, I mean, we have a measure in a statistics, you know, this measure is not uh, finally, you know, aligned with our perception in all cases, right? If you if you uh, if you have this image, for example, you know, suppose that I have these two images. Uh, according to our perception, we may say that uh, these are similar images, right? But if I compute the Fermi's norm between these two, for example, it's huge. You know, our our metrics, our measures are not always aligned with our perception. So, and it's just likelihood and likelihood of this one is more than the other one. But this is a this is better image in terms of our perception. Okay, the source code exists in. Uh, you know, TensorFlow and PyTorch and everything, and there are many, many, many variations of GAN introduced after this. It was just like a storm in the area of deep learning because it was quite novel. Uh, this is this tutorial, which I put it in the web page. You can take a look. I, I uh, wrote this tutorial with a couple of colleagues a couple of years ago and goes through many variations of Again, uh, so uh, one important or one useful variation of GAN is conditional GAN. So when you have a GAN, 
say for example in this data set it's C4 for example in C4 you have horses and you have cats and you have dogs and you have cars you know airplanes and when you do train your GAN, the, the output would be a horse, would be a cat, would be different things. Right? But, but there are in C4 10, you have 10 categories. What if I want to force the model to generate only one of these categories? You know, I want to generate only cats. You know, I, I train it on C4, but I want a cat, or I want a horse, or I want an airplane. How can I do that? Um, so this is conditional again. <coughs> Oops, <laughs> slides is about mode collapse, not conditional again. Okay, so maybe I talk about mode collapse first and then I talk about a conditional again. So uh, we, we briefly talked about mode collapse, right? Mode collapse was uh, the, uh, the case that um, you have a multimodal distribution and your model is going to learn a part of this distribution only, not the whole, right? It's going to get stuck in, 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 in part of this distribution. Uh, okay, uh, so this is an example, you know, suppose that this is your target, you know, it's a mixture of Gaussian, for example, you know, it's a mixture of Gaussian and uh, Mode collapse basically means that you're going to learn one of these Gaussians instead of all of them. So uh, if I have MNIST, for example, and my model trained on handwritten digit 8, when mode collapse happens, you're going to see something like this. You know, you don't see much variation in your data, and you will see that many of eights that have been generated are similar to each other here. It means that the, your model is going to map different z's to the same x, you know. So many different z's that you sample from your Gaussian will be mapped to identical x's at the output of your generator. That's mode collapse. Uh, <clears throat> okay, what's the ideal case of your discriminator, you know? Suppose that you uh, successfully trained again in the perfect scenario your discriminator should be completely confused you know that's the perfect scenario if your generator generate perfect images your discriminator shouldn't be make distinction between real and fake so as long as your discriminator is able to say this is fake, this is not real, means that your generator is not good enough, you know, and it is, it's not really matches the distribution of the real one because your discriminator can catch that, right? So if you have a stable GAN, if you don't have the problem of mode collapse, the accuracy of real data, is about half. And accuracy of fake data is about half, 0 0.5. It's as if it flips a coin, you know, it doesn't know what to do, you know. Can't really understand this is real or it's fake, you know. Just say something, flipping a coin. 0 0.5, you can't decide. But when you have mode collapse, you can see that the, the discriminator with a good confidence tell you it's real. You know, in many areas it's close to one. With a good confidence, tell you it's one, or tell you it's, it's, it's uh, fake, okay? So this is an indication that the model hasn't been trained properly and you're stuck in one of the modes. You know, not, I mean, it's uh, if then, not, uh, Basically, it's P anga Q, not Q anga P. It's it's necessary condition, not sufficient condition. I mean, if you observe this, the, it might be the uh, consequence of mod collapse. But it doesn't mean that, uh, uh, or, or let me put it this way. If you have mod collapse, you're going to observe it. Observe that the, the discriminator is has, has high confidence sometimes. But... It's not the other way around. Whenever you see this, 
phenomena, it doesn't mean that necessarily it's maybe the model hasn't been trained enough. You know, maybe you need to train it more. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> So one solution, uh, there, are, there are many solutions actually around mode collapse because GANs are not easy to train. You know, GANs are not easy models. I mean, it, it, it's uh, it, it not well behaved when you, you, you train them, you know. And there are many techniques to get around this mode collapse because mode collapse is quite uh, often, uh, it, it, it's quite, uh, you know, um, a, a problem which quite, uh, it happens quite often. Okay, uh, one of them is mini-batch discrimination. And the idea of mini-batch discrimination is that, uh, I mean, the, the intuition behind mini-batch discrimination is that, uh, <clears throat> suppose that I look at, I take a batch of real data, and if I have a batch of real data, In my real data, I see um, basically divergence, right? They're not, they don't look like each other completely, you know. It's not that I have 10 copies of this person in my data or 10 copies of this handwritten 8 in my data. So if I compare, for example, this data with this one, suppose that I have a measure of similarity. If I compare the similarity of this data with this one, and this data with this one, and this with this one, and this, and if I compare them with each other, you know, and supposedly that they have a measure of similarity between images, and I add them up, I come up with a number. This is a measure of similarity in this batch. Compared to the case that I have batches that shows similarity, you know. In mode collapse, our generator map many Zs to single X, right? There are many eights that are identical to each other. There's no difference between them. So if I compute the same measure here, means compare these things together and call it B, so definitely, uh, B would be larger than A, right? I mean, this batch of data shows more similarity compared to these batch of data. You know, they're less similar. So the idea of uh, mini-batch discrimination is that to use this information and inform discriminator, I mean, let discriminator to decide based on this information. In fact, you know, in, in uh, vanilla again, you're going to, I mean, discriminator is going to decide that it's real or fake based on the individual identity, you know. I, I just show one example to discriminator and ask, is it real or fake? But in mini-batch discrimination, uh, discrimination, I ask the discriminator whether or not this is fake or real in the context of a batch. Basically, I tell the discriminator that, okay, is it real or fake if I <clears throat> tell you that the other 100 data points that have been generated are, are these points. Now tell me this is real or fake. So not only decision is not only based on this individual, is based on this individual and everything else. Okay. So uh, okay, this is the problem of mode collapse. So we are going to s compute uh, the similarity, right? And let's call the similarity O of X. You know, given X, I will compare this X with everything else in the batch and add them up, call it OX. And then in my discriminator, I'm going to uh, basically, you know, my discriminator is, you know, a neural network. And 
has some layers, so suppose that it's fit forward, for example. I'm going to just concatenate whatever this measure is to one of the layers. Or somehow I'm going to inform the discriminator about this measure. So the discriminator is going to decide not only based on the input, but based on the input and this measure. Okay? If it turn out that I am in the situation of mode collapse, then this is large, right? And discriminator can decide that this is fake. And discriminator decides this is fake, which is really fake because it comes from generator. So it goes for more improvement of generator, you know? That's basically the, the whole idea of uh, mini batch discrimination. As I told you, there are many different ways, and these are just a list of some of them if you want to know. One of them is experience reply, which is pretty similar to what we had in uh, reinforcement learning in uh, this uh, gradient, uh, the policy gradient, right? That we uh, buffer some experiment from the past and then we introduce this to the model that the model don't forget about that part. Same thing actually here. There, there are many different ways that you can look at that because it's very common problem. You know, there's a list of some methods. So, uh, <clears throat> yeah, I, I was, before that, I was trying to uh, motivate conditional GAN as one of the variations of GAN. And uh, so the GAN generate, you know, as I told you, if you have a data set of 10 categories, you know, it's going to generate one of them. Uh, in conditional GAN, you want to make, you want to force the model to generate from one of these categories, you know. Should be dog, should be cat, should be whatever, car. Uh, so this is the objective function of GAN. The only difference is that the objective function of conditional GAN is that X should be conditioned on the label. And Z should be conditioned on the label. Okay? So if you change this objective function to this objective function, it's not just X. X given the label of the data, you know, and Z given the label. Then uh, you have the objective function of GAN. In practice, actually, it's very easy to implement. You know, if you have some C categories, for example, in a data, just make your label as one hot vectors. So if you have C categories, you have C type of vectors, right? One hot vectors. And then uh, you just uh, concatenate this Y with your X and your Z. That's it. So this is GAN, just concatenate Z with the label of the Z, concatenate X with the label of the Z. That's it, you know? So uh, for, for any, say for example, cat, I have one zero 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 zero, and for dog, I have zero one zero zero zero, right? Whenever I want to pass a cat to the model, I concatenate it with one zero zero zero. Whenever I want to pass a dog, zero one 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 one. Okay, that's it. That's conditional gain, you know. Uh, and in <coughs> at the time of inference, you know, that's at the time of training. And at the time of inference, basically, you concatenate the label that you want to your Z and then pass it through the model, you know. You sample from your Gaussian, concatenate it with the vector of cat, and then pass it through the model. Or concatenate it with the vector of dog, and then pass it through the model. And this is an example of conditional GAN that they force the GAN to generate only zeros, or only ones, and only nines, you know. Okay. Any question? So another uh, structure they want to talk about is advers adversarial autoencoders. So uh, we know about deterministic autoencoders or autoencoders. We know about variational autoencoder. 
an invariational autoencoder uh, by maximizing the lower bound. You know, we have an, uh, an autoencoder. This is simple autoencoder, and we have a Z here. In variational autoencoder, the only difference with the uh, like deterministic autoencoder is that we make sure that this Z is Gaussian, right? And how we do that, or has a certain distribution. How we do that by maximizing the uh, variational lower bound, you know, as we learned in the other lecture. So suppose that we want to do the same thing, but uh, knowing, knowing uh, this adversarial network, you know, uh, we have a way actually to uh, make sure that we have a way to match two distributions, right? Adversarial network can match the distribution of the data to distribute output of the generator. So suppose that this is your generator, okay? And you want the output of this to be matched to a distribution that you like. And this distribution could be Gaussian, for example, right? So I sample from a Gaussian, and then I want to match it with this distribution. So I need to put a discriminator here to tell me it's real or fake. If it's, if, if it's sample from a real Gaussian or fake means the output of my generator. So basically this part This part is just again, right? As if you have another part after the uh, generator of the GAN. So in, in um, basically uh, adversarial autoencoder, we have a generator, which is my, 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 I have encoder and decoder, and deal with this encoder as your generator and add just a discriminator, and this discriminator makes sure that the output of your encoder matches the distribution of your Gaussian, or whatever distribution that you like. Okay, that's adversarial autoencoder. So if you can do this, then you can use this part as a generative model, right? You can fit it with a Gaussian because you know this is Gaussian, you know, similar to variational autoencoder. You can fit this with Gaussian and the output would be an image, right? Or you can do dimensionality reduction with some constraint that I reduce the dimensionality of the data with the constraint that the uh, embedded space is Gaussian, for example, or Bernoulli or whatever distribution that you like to have. Yes. What's the benefit of decoder in here? Benefit of? Decoder. It's just, an, you know, autoencoder has some benefits. You know, you want to dimensionality reduction, for example. You know, you're, for, for many reasons, you may want to have uh, an autoencoder. You know, you may want to go through a bottleneck, going to lower dimensional space or higher dimensions and then come back. Could be dimensionality reduction, could be noise reduction, could be l m l representational learning. You want to have learn a representation here, which has some uh, basically benefits. You know, if you think of neural network, the whole area of deep network or neural network is about learning representations, right? If you think of uh, I mean, conceptually, you can think of many applications that we see in, in deep learning this way. That you have encoder, decoder, which takes a domain map it to itself. So an image to image, a text to text, right? And suppose that you have another encoder decoder which takes another domain and map it to itself so this is uh, 
This is image to image. This is text to text, for example. Right? Now, if I combine encoder of this one and decoder of this one, okay, then it should translate image to text. The, the only problem is that, you know, here it, it produces uh, a representation and it also produces another representation. And somehow I have aligned these two representations. I have to make some sort of alignment between these two. And in fact, many of these algorithms are for this alignment. Rather than that, it's encoder and decoder. You know, we are encoding the data to some representation and then we are decoding this back, okay? Uh, we have an algorithm for unsupervised machine translation. You know, you have a corpus of French, a corpus of English, and you don't know any relation between these two, even a word. You don't know which word corresponds to which word, which sentence corresponds to which one. And you can do unsupervised machine translation exactly through this process, you know? that French to French, English to English, but make sure that these two are aligned. And how can we make sure that this is aligned? You know, English goes to English, but, uh, and French goes to French. But I feed an English sentence, uh, pass it here, and I, I pass this. I pass this to my French decoder. Take the output of this French. You know, I pass it to the French decoder. Take the output of this French decoder. Pass it to French encoder. Pass this to uh, English decoder, and make sure that the input and output are the same. So when I pass an English, it doesn't go directly. It goes through this. Uh, path, and I make sure that these two are the same. So this align these two distribution, these two together, and then you can do translation without any supervision, right? Which is very counterintuitive, you know, to language you don't know any correspondence between these two. So basically, it, with encoder and decoder, we always going from one domain to another domain with combination of them, we can translate from one domain to another domain. Uh, and if you want to restrict your representation to have some certain distribution, one way was variational autoencoder and it is another way to do it. Okay, in uh, in supervised case, you know, that was completely, un that, I mean, uh, autoencoder is completely unsupervised, like, you know, I, I made the analogy within autoencoder and PCA, for example, if you remember, it's completely unsupervised. But consider the supervised case, similar that, you know, we have PCA and we have supervised PCA. And we have like uh, Fisher discriminant analysis, for example, which reduce the dimensionality of the data, but reduce it you know, towards our target variable. You know, I want to reduce the dimensionality of the data, but for this purpose, to, to represent the different categories, to represent different classes, you know, different space, different part of the space should be corresponding to different uh, categories that I have in the uh, data set. So you can do it with supervised, uh, basically adversarial autoencoder. And there are two structures to do that. One structure is that, you know, uh, you know, we had this structure before, right? Or let me show it to you here. So that was, that was uh, this, this part was uh, adversarial autoencoder. The only thing that I'm going to do is to uh, code the label of my data as one hot vector and I'm going to concatenate this with Z and then uh, pass it to this discriminator, 
D here. So what's the difference here? You know, in the past, you know, I didn't have, uh, in, in the past, I didn't, how can I change the color? I don't know. Yeah. So in the past, actually, I didn't have this part, right? And I was mapping, I was matching Z, uh, which comes from a Gaussian distribution with the output of this, okay, through this discriminator. Now I'm concatenating this Y with Z, so my, my encoder is forced to learn uh, a code which has two parts, which has two parts in it. The first part matches this Z, which is Gaussian, and the second part matches this one hot. So that would be the output of my encoder now, because I, I match it to Z concatenated with Y. So the first part of the encoder will looks like a Gaussian, a vector of Gaussian, the second part uh, uh, one hot. Now, if I want to basically just use this at the inference time, you know, uh, or sorry, if I want to if I want to use this as a generative model at the inference time, you know, it's I can sample from a Gaussian concatenated with one hot with the one hot that I like, okay, and then pass it through this decoder. It's going to generate, you know, an image from that category for me. So that's for supervised case. Another variation of this, which does exactly the same job, is to uh, concatenate the one hot vector explicitly to the output of encoder. You know, in this in this case, in this case. We are not explicitly concatenated, concatenating the uh, one hot vector to the output of encoder. The, the, the encoder learns a code, which is a combination of a Gaussian and one hot. But in this case, in the second case, in this one, we just match the output of encoder to a Gaussian as usual but we explicitly concatenated with a one hot. So we don't force the encoder to learn it, you know, we concatenate it ourselves and then pass it to encode, to decode, okay? It does the same job. Any question? Um, you can do clustering with this type of algorithms, okay? Uh, how can uh, I do? Uh, how can I do clustering? You know, in this case, all of my points are unlabeled. I don't know the label of the points, and I want to find the labels of the points. Uh, okay. Uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, it, this is the a structure that we just discussed for supervised case, right? the structure that we just discussed for supervised case, that if you do know the label of the points, you can concatenate it with Z and then pass it to the decoder, right? But I don't know. I'm going to add this part to the network. And, you know, compared to the previous case, uh, this has, compared to the previous case, this has been... This has been added, and this has been added, okay? So I'm going to uh, sample from this categorical data. You know, just um, say, for example, I, have f I, I decide that I have five clusters here. I'm going to sample from one of them, a one hot vector, right? And um, my encoder is going to generate 
two parts. I mean, my, the, the code of my encoder has two parts. The bottom part, I want it to be Gaussian. So this discriminator take care of that. Make sure that the, the bottom part of my code matches a Gaussian. And the upper, bound, the upper part of my encoder should match this distribution. Should, should have the distribution of categorical, you know, a one hot vector. Uh, and this discriminator will take care of that one. Take care that the upper part matches this categorical, and this take care that the, the lower part matches the uh, Gaussian. Okay. So if you train this model, eventually what your encoder generates has two parts. The bottom part, which is Gaussian, which basically tell you uh, the shape and the form of the data, whatever. And the upper part is the categorical, which tell you the cluster which cluster this coming from, you know. So you can do data clustering using basically this, uh, this, this model. Um, you can use this model in semi uh, super, yes. What do you mean? How many terms in the loss function do we have? So we have uh, basically, you know, this is, you know, this by itself has a loss that you want x2 matches x hat, right? And this part is again, which is a min max problem. And this, this part is another again, which is a min max problem. You know, you have two GANs and you have one encode. Uh, you can use this in semi-supervised scenario. In semi-supervised scenario, you can use this um, simply, you know, if you look at this structure, simply in any cases that you know the label of the data, put the real label. In the cases that you don't know the label of the data, sample from this category. You know, you can take care of, you can use the information that you have for labels that you know, and for those that you don't know, just ignore, uh, just sample. Okay. And you can use this for supervised dimensionality reduction, you know, supervised dimensionality reduction. The only additional part here with the structure that we just talked is this part. Uh, so everything else is exactly the same as before. So what we had before was that, you know, our encoder learned two parts. The, the bottom part is Gaussian, this part, and the upper part is categorical, right? So suppose that the lower part, the dimensionality of the lower part is, say, for example, P. And the dimensionality of the upper part is Q. So I'm going to multiply this Q by one matrix to W, which is uh, P by Q. So this is going to be P by one, and I have a Z, which is P by one, and I'm going to add them up, right? So basically I have, uh, I have some information, uh, some, some, some coding, you know, in, which is Gaussian. And I'm going to add it to a transformation of the label of the data in categorical form. So the summation of them has both information in it, information about the category, category of the data and information about the shape of the data, say, for example. So it, this is one form of um, basically uh, dimensionality reduction, which is put, you know, different categories in different part of the space, you know. Uh, it has many applications, as I mentioned. And as I told you, it was like a storm. 
until more recently that we had uh, stable diffusion models, you know. And the stable diffusion model in many cases replaced uh, GAN, you know. It's easier to train and it produces better results. But there are many papers in this area and some of them are applications that uh, translate one domain to another domain. So very uh, roughly, actually, in these cases, you know, in, in original GAN, I had noise translated to an image. And then I wanted to match the output of my generator, the distribution of the output of my generator with the data, right? In this case, the input of generator is not a noise, is an image. So it's image to image, right? So for example, the input of my generator is this sketch and I want the output to look like this. Or the input of generator is this and I want the output to be a map of this word, okay? Or it's black and white and I want to be colored or it is winter or, or day and I want to be night, any, any of these domains. So uh, the data set that I have has the same, uh, I mean, the generator should produce images with the same distribution of my data. And my data should be of this form or should be of maps or should be colored. I want to map it, right? But I, I, I just, instead of noise, I fit it with, with this sketch. No, what one question actually, um, you know, in, I have um, I have this generator. I used to fit it with noise, and I made sure that whatever it produces matches the distribution of this, right? Now, instead of noise, I fit it with an image and make sure that that's so far everything is okay. The output matches the distribution of this one. But on the top of that, I need some sort of one-to-one -one correspondence, right? If the input is this, I want the output to be, be exactly like this, you know? As when, I, when I'm talking about distribution, there is no one-to-one -one correspondence, you know? If the output is any of these points, similar to any of these points, the objective function mean max is satisfied, you know, because the, that objective function take care only about the distribution of the output, not the similarity of this point and this point, or similarity of this and this. So in this type of applications, there is usually one more term in the objective function which penalize the dissimilarity between the input and the output of generator, you know. There is an objective function, I mean, besides the two terms that we had in this mean max, there is one additional term which penalize, you know, the dissimilarity between these two. So it should generate something from this distribution, but similar to this one, okay. And, you know, these are other applications we can, you know, turn horse to zebra and vice versa and uh, uh, you can, you know, turn text to images, for example, the input is text here and the output is an images, or the input is image, the output is text. Um, this is, there is a, a, you can mix images to each other, you know. When we learn this uh, basically representation, we can distangle them such that a part of this representation is texture, a part is shape, a part is color, and then we can mix these parts together in this paper, mix and match. You know, you have basically, this, that's the input, you take the background of this and the shape of this and the texture of this and it's going to be this one, the output, okay? So I come Piled a long list of important papers here, then uh, and applications in the slides that you can take a look. I don't go through them and list of important papers. 
uh, in this area if you would like to know more about GAN. Any question? Okay, thank you.